Why does your sponsor bow to the political correctness and not properly display the swastika as it historically was? Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel and to another stupid comments video. You guys really seem to like these, especially the first one. I looked at that the other day and I was shocked by how many views that has accumulated. But it's gonna take more than that to impress me. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to be back with some more of those, but I don't just want to be looking at stupid comments because, you know, it is funny to laugh at people. But at the same time, I want to kind of transition this into a bit of a dumb questions combined with a bit of Q&A so that the average viewer, not somebody who thinks that the tiger was the greatest implement of battle in all of human history, can ask questions and have them answered. And uh, I won't be taking every single question, but I'll try to take some of the ones that I think are particularly useful to the wide majority of people who are watching. As part of that uh, initiative I talked about in my update video of trying to appeal to the people new to the community, because uh, I feel like that's a lot more of something I can do in this. Not really get into in-depth topics, uh, but enough waffling on about that. Let's get into the first question from the last video regarding what this thing was. I asked you all to pick something in the background. This was the thing that you picked. So this is a 3D printed FCM 36 turret. I printed on my Ender 3, not my Ender 5, before I got sick of dealing with the Ender 3 because it kept giving me issues. Uh, I would offer these as like a merch thing, but this isn't my model, so I can't do that. But uh, it's something that I'm p potentially considering in the future. Uh, we'll have to see about that. But it came out pretty decent. A little bit of warping in the corner, but I like it. It's a nice little display item in the background. And since it's basically my logo, uh, I think it's pretty neat. Anyways, pick something in the background again, and the next time we will cover it. I don't really know which one you'll pick. I, I can't really make out too much from the back. Oh, hey, <laughs> you can see my glue stick for my printer. Uh, I had to kind of change the uh, angle of this because my room is a bit of a mess down here. Uh, anyways, on to the first question from Twitter. We're going to start with a couple of those and then we're going to move into the stupid comments. When you do something like post a comment on a YouTube video, you understand that that means it can potentially be seen by countless other people. While public posts like that are normally something you don't mind others seeing, this isn't always the case when it comes to other things you do online. This is where today's sponsor, Private Internet Access, comes in. Just like you wouldn't want somebody seeing all those posts you've bookmarked on Twitter, you probably don't want various different groups sniffing around through your online data. By using a virtual private network, or VPN for short, you can encrypt that data as well as guarding your IP address with the click of a button. With so much of what I do online being dependent on various different accounts, this is something I've done in the past and will continue to do in the future because it safeguards my livelihood. A VPN can do more than just protect your data though, it can also grant you access to region-locked content. For example, Fury is currently not available on Netflix in the US, but by simply switching my location to Canada, now I can watch it without waiting. Private internet access allows you to do all of that on an unlimited number of devices for just $2.03 per month and an extra 4 months for free if you sign up using my link in the description. Not only does that save you 83%, but there is a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk to try it out. Thanks to them for sponsoring, now let's get into those stupid comments. So starting with the first one from Velma Dinkley Simp. Probably a dumb question, but if you could make one change, i.e. change the gun caliber to any historical tank, what would it be? Well that's an easy one, and it comes back to our little turret here. I would, it wouldn't really change the gun caliber, but one thing I would have liked to see is France actually complete the modified turret for the FCM 36 that would have featured the longer 37. Because out of the three tanks that they had in the light tank category in uh, World War World War II, they had the FCM 36, the H39, and the R39. And two of those could mount the longer 37, and they ended up being a bit better in terms of firepower. But all in all, the FCM 36 was kind of the best of those three, but it was really held back by the fact that it used a World War I 37mm, uh, the S, what is it, SA-18? I'll put it up on the screen if I'm wrong. And it would have had slightly better ballistic performance, which would have made it a bit more able to take out other enemy tanks. 
Uh, it would not have changed the outcome of World War II at all, but I would have liked to see it because they did a lot of testing with it and it seemed like it would have worked. Uh, the only reason they couldn't put it in the original turret is because the wells would crack, from what I recall. Anyways, on to the next question from Borzoi Enthusiast. Here's a wacky one. If Operation Sea Lion had happened, what tanks do you think the Germans could realistically bring across the English Channel with the transports they had, and how effective could they have been against British defenses? This would depend on when exactly Operation Sea Lion happened. Maybe there was an exact date they were planning for, I don't know off the top of my head, but we do know what tank they would have brought because they did testing with it. And uh, I think I talked about it in one of my shorts, there was a Panzer III that was modified to be able to be amphibious, and it had uh, basically a big snorkel on it. And those were planned for Operation Sea Lion to be dropped off, and they could go in from transports out in the water up onto land. So if we're assuming that the British Navy all went to some naval convention and were taken out by a giant random hurricane that just appeared out of nowhere, then... Germany would most likely have used things like the Panzer III for the initial landing, with the, since that was what they were testing with, and then once they got a beachhead, I assume they would have brought in the others. Now, as for the performance, you'd probably expect about the same performance as they had in uh, the invasion of France. So, you have good performance against a lot of the British light tanks, but you also have things like the Matildas, which are going to be very, very difficult for those early German guns, even the 50 millimeters, which I think the Panzer III's were up to around the time they were doing those testing. But the 37 millimeter, definitely not. So they definitely would have had some trouble until they could get the 88s, but it would be an interesting um, situation to look into, a scenario uh, more in depth. But I think you would see a similar sort of situation as uh, the invasion of France. Although, if it happened a bit later, it could be different because Britain did have some different guns or different tanks later on in the war. Up next, we have a question from Curb Mario. Are super heavy tanks nonsense, not worth to build? Well, if you look through history, it's pretty well shown that, yes, super heavy tanks are kind of a bit nonsense. You can make an argument that in certain situations, like what the U.S. was trying to do with the T-29 slash T-95 super heavy tank with their breakthrough attempt, that is sort of the only situation where a super heavy tank is really a viable option. But as we can see, it's just not really worth the weight and cost that comes with a super heavy tank when you can just build a lot of medium tanks or a couple heavy tanks for the same cost. And moving into the last question from Twitter before we get into the stupid comments you all clicked on the video for, we have one from Hanix. Why do you think German tanks are generally praised into absurdity? Well, this is actually a topic that I have talked about with uh, Ed from Armored Archives, as well as other people that I personally know quite a bit. And the reason is very similar to why the whole uh, Wunderwaffe thing is such a big clickbait item on the internet and even has been such a big topic covered ever since world war ii and it's because that's what the soldiers on the battlefield saw so let me explain a little bit imagine that you are a world war ii soldier whether you're canadian american soviet whoever what vehicles are you seeing on the battlefield well you're going to be seeing things like the sherman the t-34 cromwell churchill etc but what are you seeing on the other side? You're seeing Tiger Twos, Tiger, all those sorts of things. You're seeing things that are being captured like V1s, V2s. You're seeing potentially E100, Mouse. You're seeing all of these insane projects. And what's it going to make you think? You're seeing, well, I've got this Sherman, and I mean, it's a, it's a good tank, but I mean, the Germans are out here with a Tiger II that has armor I can't even scratch, even with the 76 that they're giving us now? What the heck? We're so far behind that. So, th and this is part of why you can't necessarily trust the uh, first-hand accounts from soldiers in wars, because they're just seeing things on the ground. They're not seeing the big picture of everything going on behind the scenes, because if they knew about all the things that the U.S. was working on, for example... The Manhattan Project, for one, uh, the T-series of heavy tanks, the Pershing, which did eventually make it into uh, battle, very limited. 
but you've got all of these big projects that the U.S. is working on. I mean, they had drones during World War II that performed missions in the Pacific. The Allied forces were miles ahead of the Germans in a lot of aspects when it comes to technology, but they just didn't see that on the battlefield because Germany was throwing things in in just the hopes that they could stop the advances of all of their enemies, but the Allies didn't really need to do that, so they could kind of keep working on those designs until they were perfect. That's why you see things like the ME262 being put into combat when realistically that vehicle was not ready for World War II. It needed quite a bit more to get it into a state where it would have been a really good aircraft. But then you see towards the end of the war, the Allied vehicles start to make their appearance into combat and they were significantly better than what the Germans had. All right, first up, we have a fairly recent one from my Nashorn video. And yet, the Nashorn still had better armor than the M18, which a lot of people think was the bee's knees. Well, this comment is uh, wrong for the most part, although there's a little grain of truth to it. So technically speaking, the Nashorn does have slightly better armor. You're talking like five millimeters more and maybe a little bit more on the sides. But realistically, if we break down the two of them, I would argue that the M18 has better overall protection. Why would I say that? Well, the front, the front of the M18 overall is better armored than the Nashorn. The Nashorn is a fairly large vehicle, and the majority of that frontal real estate, so to speak, is made up of that 10 millimeter thick superstructure. That's not very much armor. Now with the M18, you have a smaller target of the turret front, as well as the front of the hull, which is not only rounded, but it's also around 25 millimeters, I think. I'll put the exact number up on the screen. So this is kind of a stupid comment. When you get such thinly armored vehicles saying, oh, this one's better protected than the other is kind of like saying that a piece of cardboard is better body armor than a piece of cardstock. They're both not particularly good at stopping things that are flying towards you that want to kill you. So kind of a stupid comment. Good little warm up one for us here. Up next, we have one that really goes schizophrenic. As Ukraine looks into yet another mobilization, abducting men on the streets, sending even mentally disabled to the front, let me just ask you this. How are your Googling skills holding up? Or maybe I was right, huh? I don't, I don't even know what is going through this guy's head. Now, I, the first half of this comment, I'm not going to get into. You can debate that in the comments if you really want to. I don't understand what it has anything to do with my Googling skills, though. Are my Googling skills pulling Ukrainian men off of the streets and sending them to the front? If so, I apologize. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, I don't know how. I tried to look and see if this guy had sent a comment before, but I couldn't find anything. So I don't know what he means by maybe I was right. I don't know. I just feel like this guy is just having a breakdown and he felt the need to leave a comment on my who took the Tonk video about the Ukraine war? Okay. All right. This one, I'm not even going to read the whole thing. If you want to, you can go through and uh, go ahead and do it. I'll leave it up on screen while I talk about it. But I do want to read this very last bit here because it makes me laugh. The fact I even need to say anything just makes my head hurt. It's like you're saying a piece of shit tastes better than a taco. Say no to drugs, people. So what this guy is uh, talking about is the uh, myth of the Tiger tank requiring numerous Shermans to knock out, which I believe I mentioned in my Firefly video. I think this is the one that this uh, comment was on. And he is basically having a meltdown because apparently me saying that having the multiple Shermans to knock out a Tiger being a myth is actually basically me spitting in the face of every single World War II veteran because they were there. They know what they saw. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, just because somebody was there doesn't mean they saw the bigger picture. And I think he start I think he quotes like death traps and stuff later on, which it's a good book, not for the purposes of talking about Sherman performance though in the in World War II. So, yeah, basically just a big meltdown of typical, you know, well, they were there, they know what they saw, and it's like, look, I get it, I respect veterans very much. Obviously, a lot of us wouldn't be here if it weren't for them. But 
I'm not going to say that they're always correct. And in some cases they are very wrong, which in the case of death traps is true. And in the case of some other veterans is also very true. Not everybody that goes and writes a book is necessarily right. Moving on, we have one from my IS-7 video. No anti-tank from world could stop it. Then go get a job anyways, patriotic school kid. Look, Pim, I know it's our job to help this guy and everything, but I think this guy's a lost cause. He's obviously made up his mind. Why don't we just cut our losses and get out of here? All right, coming in on the Kugelblitz video. Oh, a tank being uncomfortable? This means nothing. It's neither here nor there. Arbitrary. So what? I think I stated my point. I don't think that comfort is... I, I, okay, comfort can be arbitrary. But if I say to you, man, that car that I just drove was really uncomfortable, I think you understand what I mean by that. It was an unpleasant experience. And in some ways, you know, it can impair your ability to drive properly. The same can be said for a tank. If you get into a tank and you're crunched in, you can barely move your shoulders, your legs are stuck, not only is it going to be not very good if you have to bail out of said vehicle, but you're going to agree that that is uncomfortable and it's going to make you less, ple it's going to make you enjoy your job a lot less. So no, comfort is not really a here nor there thing. You, it, it's, it is a very legitimate concern for vehicles. So this was uh, part of a discussion where somebody was basically uh, complaining to me about using in-game footage, which is another common complaint that I want to get into in this video. Uh, but they say, do your homework, dude. If you are a lazy A, you do not want to dig in the web and bring real footage. Why you get upset when I call your upload amateurish? Your idea of using silly video games material is very childish. When you can found footage from and about almost anything today, like I said, childish and lazy as opposed to professional. Now, I understand where this person is coming from to a degree, but what I don't think they understand is that not every single vehicle has a wealth of footage available online. In fact, many of the tanks that I talk about on my channel have very little, if any, a physical presence left on this planet. Sometimes I am down to like five photographs if I'm lucky. And it is very difficult to make a 15 minute long video when I have five photos because I try to kind of show you guys what I'm talking about on the screen as I'm doing it rather than just cycle through like generic stock footage and like five photos shown over and over again. I will occasionally do repeat photos if I don't have enough, but I try very hard to kind of show you guys what I'm looking at. And when it comes to specific vehicles that exist in video games, such as World of Tanks or War Thunder or other games in some cases, I don't see why there's any reason I shouldn't use those because it's either that or I spend potentially 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 plus dollars on getting a custom made model and renders just so that I can show you guys the exact same thing that I could have done just using War Thunder or World of Tanks. Especially when it's a sponsored video with one of those and I can just kind of incorporate that as part of the sponsored element. I don't see any reason why that's an issue and I don't really get why you guys, well, some of you guys have issues with that. It, I, I see it fairly frequently and I really don't understand it because it's like would you rather just have a black screen if you'd rather have a black screen it saves me a heck of a lot of time in the editing bay I can just throw a black screen over the whole video you guys can just listen to my voice <laughs> all right we got a comment on Porsche's elephant the Panzer Jaeger Tiger P which I have since changed the name of uh Konevark reports at 6 30 that the Ferdinand was armed with the Pac-43 false the Ferdinand was armed with the Pac-36 the difference between the two guns is considerable. Look for a shell size comparison picture. It was the follow-on Elephant that was armed with the Pac-43. Well, we see here an example of somebody that commented before they watched the video, because if they watched the video, they would know that the Ferdinand and the Elephant are exactly the same. The only difference being that the Elephant name came around the time when they refitted the Ferdinands, so they look a little bit different, but they are the exact same vehicle. Uh, and yes, they both mounted the Pac-43. All right, on Flaming Hot Panzers, the Panzer II Flam. Why does your sponsor bow to the political correctness and not properly display the swastika as it historically was? 
Didn't Germany rescind that law prohibiting it in games? Why the censorship? Now, I won't say I entirely disagree with what this person is saying, because I do think that the complete outright ban of basically allowing anybody to use the swastika purely because the Nazis used it is a little bit silly at times. You gotta kind of understand that there are a lot of people out there who were affected by the Nazis, and for obvious reasons, the swastika is kind of a bit of a sensitive symbol. And I mean... I think it's a fair compromise to not include that in your video game, especially when, I mean, it is historical, but does it really matter if you have a particular symbol in your game when that's not even the focus of the game? I don't think it really matters all that much, personally. All right, moving on. People more qualified, oh, qualified than you, Cone of Arc, have said no drones do not make tanks obsolete like tanks didn't make infantry obsolete. What will happen? Tanks will evolve. Now I heavily suggest you do some actual research on anything. Funny you should say that because I just so happened to make an entire video talking about uh, why the drone is not the end of the tank. And uh, I, I don't remember if this was on that video. If it was, that would be really funny. But uh, I have never claimed that the drone is the end of the tank. I have talked about whether it is or not. And in fact, I brought somebody who was more qualified than myself to talk about it in the form of Paul Shari, if you haven't seen that video and the full interview. I thought that that was a very interesting look at uh, somebody that not only has a little bit more information on that sort of uh, fighting than I do, but also a look at sort of the history of all the different things that were the death of the tank. So if you haven't seen those, I will link them down below and up in the corner if I remember. All right, up next we have a comment saying, the tank was not that great because Patton wanted a light tank. Tank battles were won by attrition because it was two to four tanks per tiger. Men died in battle so you can sell merch. Here. That is disgusting. And I guess he really wanted me to see it because he left it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times. Uh, the first half of the comment, whatever, you know, fair enough. That's not really anything wrong with that. As for the portion at the end of men died in battle so you can sell merch, I don't see how I'm profiting off the death of anyone just because I made merch about a particular vehicle. I'm not being like, oh man, all these people died. Guess you guys should buy some merch. I, <laughs> I would hope that you guys don't take it as that. I'm sorry if you do. That has never been my intention. At Cone of Arc, I am not trying to be unpleasant, but the sheer number of adverts on YouTube is getting out of control, and frankly, there is no need to finance your videos. Some makers may have a reasonable case, but there is nothing in this that costs you anything but time. And sincerely, I hope you enjoyed making the video. As I said, I am not going to be nasty, but excessive advertising is making YouTube much worse than it used to be. Do it for the fun. Do it for the prestige, not for a snake oil cures and a couple of pounds in the bank. Now, I don't entirely disagree with this comment, and I do understand that, you know, advertising can get annoying at times. But what I take issue with is the part where they say that it doesn't cost me anything but time, and that I should do it for fun and do it for the prestige. You know the saying that time is money? There's a reason why that's a saying. I could have taken the time that it took me to make all of these videos and I could have gone and worked another job. I could have gone and made money doing other things, but instead I took that same time and I spent it making this content for you guys. I do think that I should be able to profit off of that because I'm putting my time and effort into recording, writing, researching, and editing all this content for you guys. You can call me selfish for that, I guess, but uh, I disagree. I put in a lot of time on most of these videos. Some of them take a little bit less than others, but for the most part, they take quite a bit of time, especially in the editing. So uh, until such time as I can support myself off of purely YouTube ad revenue and other forms of revenue, such as things like merch and that, uh, I'm going to have to take sponsorships. It's just part of being a YouTuber, unfortunately. Up next, we have another comment on the Sherman Firefly video. This one just absolutely farmed entertaining comments. First, just because a lot were built doesn't mean they are good. Previously, they needed a lot, so they built a lot. Second, how many Shermans were destroyed against the German tanks? The Sherman Easy is way too high. As the best German tank commander said, how beautiful is the silhouette of the Sherman in the morning? <laughs> 
You serious? Not sure about the uh, validity of that uh, little comment from the German tank commander there, but uh, as for the rest of it, just because a lot were built doesn't mean they are good. Usually when something is produced in large numbers, that means it's a pretty decent design. Now, not always. There are cases of vehicles that are not particularly good being made in large numbers, but it's not really the case with the Sherman. And when you come to how many Shermans were destroyed against the German tanks, this is a bit of a misleading uh, thing here because... Yes, there were a lot of Shermans knocked out by German tanks, but you also need to consider how many of the Allied crews actually died and how many of those Shermans and other tanks were able to be put back into service relatively quickly. I think that's something that not a lot of people consider. Uh, as for the fact of the Sherman Easy being too high, look up uh, a Tiger sitting next to a Sherman. They're basically the same height, so I don't understand this argument. And that about wraps it up for this episode of stupid comments with a little bit of q a sprinkled in if you enjoyed it be sure to let me know and don't forget to uh, check out private internet access using that link below and help support the channel uh, if you want me to do another one of these let me know and uh, pick something in the background that i will talk about in the next video thank you all so much for watching and i'll see you next time